Warner Brothers presents Behind the Scenes with Blake Edwards, The Great Race. On your marks, get set, go. They're off on The Great Race, 20,000 miles from New York to Paris. Such a race actually took place in 1908. But any resemblance between that event and the round-the-world hijinks in this unique motion picture is purely coincidental. Anything goes here. A flying trapeze that flies too low. A speedboat that plays tag with a torpedo. Submarine with a human periscope. Down! Down! You idiot! Ah! An airborne bicycle built for two. A newfangled rocket engine that literally burns up the track. An early morning dip in the pool. A backseat driver in a fancy fur coat. And custard pies in six delicious flavors. In The Great Race, you won't need a scorecard to tell the heroes from the villains. As the great Leslie, daredevil Tony Curtis is obviously noble, honorable, and pure as driven snow. A sort of hero's hero. His rival and arch enemy, Professor Fate, is another kettle of fish. Hiding behind that mustache and that sneer is Jack Lemon. His suspicious looking buddy in crime is Peter Falk. A diabolical hero indeed. The great Leslie has a major domo too, in the person of Keenan Wynn. Everyone knows if you have heroes and villains clobbering one another, you also need a lovely damsel in distress. Or, or undress. Hmm. At any rate, we have a heroine well worth fighting over, Miss Natalie Wood. And that's no idle reflection, as you can see. The interior of a studio soundstage is somewhat like a jungle, only instead of trees and underbrush, there are cameras, sound booms, lights, and the restless natives, shuffling about in a perpetual war dance. Off stage, these young ladies are being primped and powdered to please the sensitive eye of the cameras. To some, it may seem like gilding the lily. Waiting between scenes, performers read or knit. Some play cards. Others shoot pool. Tony apparently has too many points racked up already, so Jack figures he needs a little extra handicap. Dorothy Provine has picked a quiet corner to practice maneuvering in that tight-fitting gown. Looks like she's trying to catch a train. This sequence takes place in a dance hall somewhere in the wild and woolly west. Director Blake Edwards is explaining the routine to the players and extras. Let's watch a part of the camera rehearsal as Dorothy Provine comes to the finale of a rousing honky-tonk number. He shouldn't have had an out and a swing on me. Backstage, Tony Curtis limbers up for the next scene. One of the trickiest sequences to put on film is a fight, especially an all-out barroom brawl where everything happens at once. If you zig when you're supposed to zag, you may end up with a genuine black eye, or a lot worse. Working with the stars are experienced stunt performers who get paid a premium for knowing how not to get hurt when the fists and glass and furniture start flying. There won't be much left of this fancy beer hall once the Donnybrook starts, so hold on tight now while we watch a small sample of the merry mayhem exactly as the cameras recorded it.
stars of the great race haven't been properly introduced yet. Not people, automobiles. This is the Leslie Special, designed to outrun any other 1908 car in fair competition. But there's nothing fair about the Hannibal 8, Professor Fate's secret weapon. It's as full of dirty tricks and nasty surprises as its Machiavellian master. This Siberian village learns all about smog from the treacherous Hannibal 8. There's always a hubbub of activity between scenes. It's a good time for press interviews and short conferences, for greeting unusual visitors like this touring troop of Boy Scouts from Japan, for admiring beards and trying one on for size, for working on a suntan, or would you call it a snow tan, or for removing some of the mud from a friend and co-star. The great Leslie takes to the air in this sequence. And being a professional daredevil, he does it the hard way, tied in a straitjacket and suspended head down. This in-flight shot isn't trick photography. It's the real thing. The camera is mounted on a helicopter, hovering over the balloon as it drifts at 10,000 feet. It's a big jump from a balloon to a modern passenger jet like the one that brought the great race company to the first location site in Europe, Vienna, Austria. Reporters, photographers, and fans greet the film celebrities as they disembark. Tony Curtis had recently become a proud father. His lovely actress wife, Christine Kaufman, carries their firstborn, a girl. Mrs. Jack Lemon is also famous as a star in her own right, Felicia Farr. Arriving on a later flight, Natalie Wood has to run a similar gauntlet. Traveling is much more complicated for a celebrity than it is for a private citizen. Especially during arrivals, you really have to be on your toes, always ready with a quick smile, as much poise and elegance as you can muster after a long trip, and quotable answers to rapid-fire questions from the eager press. Vienna is proud of its great musical heritage. The famous Vienna State Opera House has been faithfully rebuilt after almost complete destruction in World War II. It's a bustling modern metropolis now, but the old ways have not entirely disappeared. Scouting locations is an important facet of picture making. Most sightseers are motivated only by appreciation of beauty. To this, the filmmaker must add a keen eye for detail in his search for camera settings to help him tell his story. Blake Edwards sizes up this location with the producer, Martin Giraud. In the heart of Vienna stands Karl's Church, built for the Emperor Karl VI in the early 18th century. The majestic interior will be the setting for a colorful ceremony. However, the man who'll wear the crown looks like the wily professor. His exit from the church will be a lot more hurried than his entrance. One free day in Vienna, Natalie Wood set out to do some sightseeing on her own. It was a good idea, but she didn't reckon with photographers who kept asking her to pose for just one more until her free day sort of disappeared. However, Natalie did manage to have some fun along the way in the Volksprater, Vienna's popular amusement park. That giant Ferris wheel was erected back in 1897. The Hofburg, royal palace of the Habsburg monarchs, played an important role in the filming of the great race. A palace hallway was converted into a makeup room to accommodate the many extras to be costumed and coiffured in grand style for a spectacular ballroom sequence. Jack Lemon's makeup man adds a few finishing touches and Presto, in full regalia, he's ready to make a dignified grand entrance to the ball. These Viennese charmers, most of them highly paid professional models when they're not working in motion pictures, are as excited as if they were real ladies in waiting and were about to be presented at the royal court. Even with the clutter of lights and camera equipment, the grand ballroom of Hofburg Palace provides an impressive setting for the fashionable ladies and their elegant escorts. 
One always thinks of humor as being spontaneous and unrehearsed. But any performer or director will tell you that comedy requires planning and precise timing. Now they're ready for a run through. Jack Lemon gives the signal, and the waltz begins. The next stop is beautiful Salzburg, site of one of the oldest settlements in recorded history and birthplace of Mozart. This storybook castle is a charming anachronism in today's jet age, the perfect setting for an idyllic fairy tale or a madcap motion picture called The Great Race. Every castle has its dungeons and this one is no exception. In the course of rescuing the fair Natalie from duress vile, the great Leslie has a duel with the infamous Baron von Stupa. They practice their thrusts and parries for many months under the guidance of a fencing master. Since they'll play this scene without protective masks or padding, they must plot their moves very carefully. As Tony puts it, I hate the sight of blood, especially when it's my own. He has a point there, wouldn't you say? In the center of old Salzburg is the Domplatz, an imposing square dominated by a great Romanesque cathedral. It's crowded now with thousands of costumed extras on hand to welcome the Leslie special as it completes another lap of the great race. The townspeople of Salzburg have abandoned their daily routines to participate in the excitement. They know a movie star when they see one. They'll cheer for their film favorites no matter who wins the great race. While cinematographer Russ Harlan makes sure the cameras will capture all the action on film, the arrival of Natalie Wood on the set causes a stir among Austrian fans working as extras. Her costume is unconventional to say the least. She discusses its finer points with director Blake Edwards before they resume shooting. Jack Lemon's in a bit of a hurry. When you're outnumbered, a quick getaway is the better part of valor. It's early fall in Paris. Next stop in Warner Brothers' globetrotting camera safari. At any time of year, the City of Light proudly displays its infinite charms. costume designer must outfit nearly 2,000 Parisians, both men and women, in authentic 1908 fashions for the next sequence. These chic mamzelles have been specially chosen to show the costumes to best advantage. Some are mannequins in the most exclusive Paris fashion salon. Nowadays, the ladies don't go in for fancy hats like great grandma used to sport. These stylish extras recapture an era of sumptuous elegance. Beneath the steel girders of the Eiffel Tower, a world-famous landmark since the Paris Exposition of 1889, our adventure in filmmaking reaches an exciting climax. The moment is charged with mixed emotions, not only for the storied characters of the screenplay, but also for the huge cast and crew, the many thousands who have participated in the filming of this unique motion picture, The Great Race. But hold on, what's happening here? Is Jack Lemon demanding a rematch? Well, maybe this is only the beginning of The Great Race.